Niet lijkt links uh, lip gloss. <laughs> so we actually we live. Well, almost. Okay. So guys, thank you so much um, for joining us. Thank you for, you know, gracing uh, the invitation at such a short notice to come have a talk with us about what just happened in Malawi. We all uh, were obviously watching on the news and just pretty much following it up. And it's always interesting because what we do on this platform is to, you know, not just engage millennials, but to also hear from millennials in terms of, you know, so yeah, I had to show my faith there. So we have to hear from millennials across the continent. Um, so we can, number one, just try and inspire them in terms of Africa, African pride, and not just the whole euphoria of being proudly African, but really help them understand some of the real socioeconomic issues that happen across the continent, because it's important, because these are emerging leaders, some of which already are leaders. So thank you so much for joining us. We do have some guests who may join later in a few minutes, but in the meantime, I'm gonna ask that we start off with you two that are present. Um, and I'm gonna start welcoming you, Ulemu Kanyongolo. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, Ulemu is the founder of the Young Feminist Network in Malawi, and she's based in Malawi. Thank you for joining us this evening. I know we're on the same time zone, so there's no train smash with you know, time difference and stuff. And um, my other guest is Levi Kabwato, a good friend, he is, many things, comrade, <laughs> thinker, <laughs> scholar, <laughs> uh, but he, quite a very passionate African, what I know for sure. Levi, thank you so much for, for joining us as well this evening. Uh, I don't want to put her on the spot, but Elivin is, is uh, you know, logging in. You know, Elivin, thank you for joining us. I, maybe I shouldn't introduce you yet, because I know you, you're probably just trying to, you know, settle down. So, you know what, Levi, let me start with you mainly because you write a lot <laughs> and because you're obviously passionate about uh, Malawi but you know what just hold that thought for a bit I, I need to welcome some of the guests that are coming in so Moses is also uh, joining us Moses Funkuyu who is the former minister of information and communications in Malawi and, uh, one of the networks for the ruling Malawi Congress Party. Thank you for joining us. We'll allow you to settle in. You can mute your mic in the meantime. Let me start off with you. Thank you all for joining us. It seems like we're a complete team now. So in South Africa, when we elected a new president, we called it a new dawn. And um, whether or not it has been a new dawn, that leaves much to be said. But I take it that Malawi is pretty much going through the same trajectory as well this week. You guys have essentially just entered into your new dawn, for lack of a better word, if I can put it that way. And Levi, I want to start off with you. You have um, written quite a lot of Malawi. You have written quite a lot, basically, in Malawian and South African print media. What has been your analysis of the political landscape in Malawi uh, over the years, starting from the days of President Mutarika and then Banda to date? What has been your analysis of the entire landscape of Malawi's politics? Uh, thanks, Jabalile, uh, for organizing this uh, dialogue. And this is such an important platform. So I also just want to congratulate you for you know, uh, creating this space uh, for these conversations that are very, very uh, important. I've been following some of your conversations with various guests, and it's really uh, a very powerful and very timely must I say, uh, platform for young people, especially. I'm not sure if I'm a millennial or if I should consider myself. Here he says I am, but uh, <laughs> that's for another day. Uh, I mean, your question is really tough uh, to, to answer, to be honest. Um, but what I can say about the political space in Malawi is really its uh, dynamism, right? It's not short of any drama, it's not short of any. Um, developments that really uh, can be uh, quite exciting, but also uh, full of uh, disappointment, uh, full of um, <clears throat> what I can say maybe as, um, yeah, just, it can be depressing uh, sometimes. And for somebody like myself who uh, consistently uh, writes about Malawi, <clears throat> excuse me, 
it's it can it can weigh on you, especially if you're one person who is you know full of hope, uh, full of um, you know dreams for your country, uh, as it were. I was reflecting the other day, and it turns out that I've been writing about Malawi for like the past 18 years, so it's really like a very long time. Uh, and in that space, it's really a range of emotion because you can't really uh, divorce yourself from. Uh, what's going on in your country and also then being outside of Malawi, larger part of my life I've lived outside of Malawi uh, and being that, that, that on its own has it's, its uh, various factors which are also linked to the idea of the political space uh, in Malawi, especially when mm -hmm. we discuss things like uh, citizenship or you're discussing uh, as was happening uh, just uh, recently as well uh, the Citizenship Act, whether to allow dual citizenship and stuff like that. When you have a growing community of Malawians that have exited uh, the country for want of, uh, you know, a better opportunity, uh, as it were. But the space from we got independent in 1964, and for the next 29 or so years, uh, we had. Uh, a dictatorship under Kamuzu Banda, which collapsed in 1993, leading uh, to a new democratic dispensation in, from about 1994, uh, as it were. And this is the idea back, back then was really for multi party democracy. The Malawi Congress Party, which is the party that's currently re leading the Atonse Alliance, um, is the party of Kamuzu Banda, as it were. The thinking of all these parties, which were like uh, semi-nationalistic uh, parties at the time, was obviously of a one-party state or a single dominant party uh, within that space. Uh, so for the longest time, the logic soon after independence, certainly in the late 50s and early uh, 1960s, was that for development to happen, what you needed was a one party state. So the state became the party and the party became uh, the state. Uh, is it so in 1993, uh, the growing from about say 1992, when the pressure was really uh, rising uh, to you know, demand that Banda exit, Akamuzu Banda that is, that is the political space, the thinking was, if we have a multi-party democracy, it will necessarily allow uh, development to happen in Malawi. Because what had then happened uh, leading up to that time uh, was a lot of um, uh, political uh, tensions, uh, people hound being hounded out of uh, you know academic spaces, out of political spaces. So you could there was no room for dissent, right? If you yeah. sort of deviate with Kamuzu Banda, uh, you were out. And um, my father actually is one of the earliest casualties uh, for that, having been one of the people who actually invited Kamuzu Banda to come and lead uh, Malawi into, in, into independence. But so many other people, um, some who actually mm -hmm. ultimately paid um, with their lives, uh, some who were actually harassed, um, you know, who, and most of these were the founding uh, members of the Malawi Congress Party. I'm giving you this history yeah. so that we actually yeah. then understand how politics plays a central role in Malawi, precisely because the thinking in, in the early 90s was that multi-party democracy necessarily will translate into uh, a developmental uh, agenda, as it were. But also in the early 90s, as you are aware, this is the time of uh, neoliberal logic uh, from the World Bank, from the IMF, yeah. is actually taken root. So we have the economic uh, structural adjustment programs that are being sort of like implemented. And Kamuzu Banda being actually a very compliant uh, post-colonial leader, you know, sort of like a puppet of the West, uh, if you like, um, was also beginning to come under fierce pressure. I mean, if you really want to look at this legacy, you point no other to the fact that uh, Malawi had uh, very good relations with apartheid uh, South Africa, uh, as it were, which is quite problematic uh, in itself. But post-1994, what then happens is that you now have this multi-party democracy, which uh, then you have uh, what we, what 
is even up to now is called the United Democratic Front leading uh, that whole agitation. But most of the people who make up the UDF in the early uh, 1990s are also coming from the MCP, uh, including Bakili Mulusi, who then leads uh, the UDF itself, right? So fast forward to um, the early 2000s, when mm -hmm. Bakili Mulusi now has to give up power because he's constitutionally um, guaranteed or mandated two terms in office are expiring. And he says, you know what? I think I might as well go for a third term. So Bakili Mulusi's attempt for a third term is essentially the MCP's idea of a one party state. So what basically Bakili Mulusi is saying is the UDF is not done with, uh, you know, sort of like developing Malawi as it were. Uh, what we now need is uh, this party to remain in power, but we all know, or people knew at the time, that <laughs> the UDF staying in power, and particularly Bakili Mulusi staying in power, really just meant that they want to, you know, plunder the state further. There were so many corruption scandals that were unearthed uh, at the time, notwithstanding the other the positive things that were happening, you know, so the space really opened up, the space opened up for civil society organizations, uh, for freedom of expression, uh, the judiciary, you know, the military and other security, although, you know, the police in Malawi, I would contend that there's this still some work that needs to be done there in terms of reform, right? Um, because under Bakili Mulusi, there's a lot of a lot, a lot that happens with the police. But one thing that has stuck with me is really the killing of uh, a, an artist, uh, a reggae artist called Evison Matafale, who dies in police custody. And we know Matafale was really critical of uh, Mulusi's, uh, you know, government, as it were. So there are also these things that are happening uh, during uh, yeah. Mulusi's um, tenure. So he brings. Uh, because there's so much resistance to the third term uh, attempt, his way around it is to bring an outsider uh, who is uh, Bingu Amutarika uh, and imposes him on the UDF, the party, to then say, well, okay, this party won't let me have my way or people won't, have me, uh, won't let me have my way in uh, getting the third term that I want. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna bring in this outsider and I'm just sort of gonna you know, mold him and make him a figurehead whilst I get my third term through the back door, right? And as we know now, that didn't happen, right? So Bingo comes in um, with all the chaos on the back of a stolen uh, election in 2004, uh, a case of which is now actually was used in this uh, 2020 or 2019 electoral challenge. Uh, and it's really the case of uh, Gwanda Chakwamba who really felt that um, the election was stolen from him to give uh, Bingo Mutarika uh, the victory as it were, right? So Bingo comes in, he forms his own political party. There are people who defect from the UDF and other parties. They join uh, DPP because that's what happens in Malawi most of the times. You're part of the losing clique. You see that you're losing or you've lost. You <laughs> change sides and join um, <laughs> the, the party that is now in power. That, and that's really a huge problem. And that's a, that has been one of the most uh, disappointing uh, things, and I'm glad Moses is uh, joining, or he's on the call. Perhaps he can, yeah. you know, speak uh, to that I'm question now. Mm. So we have Bingo, who, you know, again, you know, because people are so disgruntled with um, Lucy, but people embrace what Bingo does to the UDF and really say, "Wow, this is good. We now have a break from the D, uh, from the UDF. Lucy was corrupt and everything." And, you know, Bingo comes in and he's really like this God sent president for, for Malawi. He's speaking the right language. You know, he's making the right guarantees. Uh, uh, even, you know, in terms of prosecutions, there's zero tolerance uh, for corruption. And if I'm not mistaken, um, this is the time he hires one of uh, the directors of uh, public prosecutions called uh, Ishmael Wadi uh, at that time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then, you know, Wadi just becomes like this superstar uh, in Malawi because he's going after the big shots and stuff. But over time, this fizzles out. But what happens in 2009 when we have another election is that Bingu is rewarded. 
at the polls. So a landslide, an electoral landslide. I don't think many people really contest what happened in uh, uh, in, in 2009, because that was really an obvious uh, DPP victory. They didn't need to read. If they read, maybe, you know, they did, but they actually didn't need to read that election, in my view, that is. Um, so Bingu is rewarded, but what happens in Bingu's second term is exactly what happened in Luzi's second term. Again, Bingu wants to, you know, sort of like control how succession happens. So he brings his brother back from the US, who was a so-called uh, professor uh, of constitutional law in the, in, the, in the US, comes back, becomes minister, I think becomes minister of higher education. There's a strike at um, one of the biggest universities in Malawi, all the biggest universities in Malawi, is Ule who would actually correct me, uh, Chancellor College, but you know, this guy is just ambivalent. Uh, Peter Mutarika, he's just like not interested for months, uh, right? And these are the early pointers of the impunity with which uh, Peter Mutarika would then uh, govern uh, Malawi, or misgovern Malawi, so to speak. But what happens briefly, uh, Jabudu, before I just uh, wrap up, is in 2012, Bingu collapses, right, and, and dies. Peter, the brother, and uh, working in cahoots with several people from the DPP, the party, they tried to usurp power from Joyce Banda, who was the vice president at the time. And one of the good, good, good things with the Malawi constitution is that the office of the vice president is protected. So you can't just hire and fire like a vice president, you know, willy nilly, you, you, you're not able to do that. So, Joyce Banda comes into power, Peter tries, they fail, and they, they contest the election in 2014. The DPP wins, which was a very, very shambolic uh, election by all accounts. But we also have, you know, Joyce Banda on the other side, trying to annul the election for her own reasons and so on and so forth. Then the Banda, Joyce Banda, that is really just lasts about two years in power. But under Joyce Banda, there is the Cashgate a scandal, one of the largest corruption scandals uh, to, you know, uh, engulf Malawi. So that scandal happens, and it really also then points to a state of decay. Uh, there's a public service that is no longer efficient, highly corrupt, uh, provision of services. It's just like everything is just collapsing. Uh, right, and that's what we learn from Cashkin. Apart from all these other people uh, helping themselves to billions of um, of kwacha, as it were. Fast forward then to 2019, uh, where Peter Mutarika is trying to get um, uh, a second term, uh, as it were, in office. Uh, right, and there's just one of the most chaotic elections uh, you will ever see. This disgruntlement, Peter is really, this is really like an aloof uh, leader. You know, he's just, he, he wouldn't even inspire confidence uh, as your president. You know, you just look at this guy and you'd be like, wow, what did we do here? But Peter tries to stay into, in power. He doesn't, he doesn't succeed. Well, he succeeds briefly, uh, but there's a, uh, an election petition uh, that comes, people refuse. Uh, to accept that you know this this was the case. There's a lot of evidence that also points to that that election was not credible and it was not free and it was not fair, which then leads to this um, other fresh what is called in Malawi the fresh presidential poll, uh, which was recently held like uh, I think two weeks ago now, which then brings in um, yeah. Lazarus Chapera, who is also a very interesting character. When he came to the MCP in 2014. Uh, actually, I was actually there on the day he was uh, uh, sort of like uh, revealed to, to, to the party. Uh, and it was like a very strange uh, person to bring into the MCP, uh, a reverend. Uh, but as it turns out, you know, one of the most logical decisions that the MCP uh, eventually made from that 2014. The problems, Jabulile, in short, intra-party democracy, really in shambles, the, uh, our political parties are weak in Malawi. In as much as there's all these good things that election happen, uh, elections happen according to schedule and everything is okay in sectors like the judiciary and so on and so forth. But 
our politics are really, really influenced by weak political parties, which then necessitates this, you know, movement of political parties from one party to another. Um, parties who, which when they're elected into office, it's really like, it's our turn to eat. You guys just keep quiet until the next time. And this is my fear with uh, uh, the, the new dawn, what you call the new dawn. Can I, can, I, can I get you to, to keep on, just hold on to that because I want you to outline that when we talk about the hopes and dreams later. So just, right, just right. hang on to that. Thank okay. you for, for your cool. analysis. So we have a picture of essentially how Malawi's uh, you know, political sort of uh, landscape has been over the past sort of what, decade or so. Um, Ulemu, I want to bring you in here as a young woman and I'm so glad that Moses, thank you so much for joining us again and Elevin, but I want to ask you, in your view, were Malawian women represented during this, you know, political manifestos? Do you believe that political parties paid attention to what Malawian women uh, needed to hear from a government that is leading them or is going to lead them? Um, I just want to say I'm so glad that we're having this conversation, much needed conversation. And yeah, um, for me, I'm, I'm 23 years old. So these elections were, it was my first proper experience with elections. It was my first time voting. So I was very invested, <laughs> particularly as a young feminist. I wanted to know what are you going to do for women? What are you going to do for other minority groups? So um, I took time to read the manifestos and I was disappointed to say the least. Um, what I got from the manifestos was that it was mere rhetoric. Um, I didn't see any bold and innovative strides for the advancement of women's rights or any, anything that was inspiring to me as a young woman who's going through like the experience of, of her first time voting. There wasn't anything that stood out to me that said, oh, this party is interested in women's rights. So for instance, um, a lot of the parties in their manifestos they were putting women's issues under the broader category of other issues. So it was different from the way um, they'd have an entire chapter on health or an entire chapter on economics or whatever the case may be. The same way uh, there's a right to health, the right to economic activity, women's rights are human rights. So I expected a chapter to at least be dedicated to women's rights. But for instance, you saw um, some issues, uh, for example, in the, UTM, one of the political parties in the in UTM's manifesto, women's issues were put under social policy. And I think um, they were given maybe a paragraph or two, and that was about it. And for me, even what was included in it, and not just for UTM, but for most of the political parties, it, there was nothing bold. There was nothing that I hadn't seen before that would inspire a young woman to say, oh, this is the party for me because it's looking out for my rights. And so in doing that, in them, missing such an opportunity to come out clearly on what they're going to do for women's rights. I think they, they completely missed the nuances when it comes to women's rights. They ignored the fact that the underlying causes of inequality, I expected to see some things that addressed, maybe not directly, but it, it had to come out that they, this is the specific thing they're going to do, this is what they're going to do, and that just didn't come clearly. And in some actually in most of them, maybe all of them, um, as regards women's rights, a lot of them were saying that they're going to uphold the constitution and this, this section, and um, they're going to make sure that the guarantees in the constitution for gender equality are achieved. And it was sort of like, it's obvious. <laughs> that's what, yes, we know that that's what you're going to do, but how are you going to do it? That's nothing new. It's as if, to be honest, it, it's, it's sort of what uh, someone would write in an assignment in first year. That's what I'd write in an assignment. Like, what are you going to do? I'm going to respect the constitution. I'm going to uphold it. Okay, yes, you're meant to uphold it. It's not a favor. Mm -hmm. So what exactly are you going to do? And that didn't come out at all. So I'd say looking at, looking at it from that angle, um, women's rights were definitely not addressed adequately or at all, one could argue. And... In addition to that, in terms of women's needs, that didn't come out either. And it was very clear that it was an afterthought. 
they didn't take the time to undertake any consultation with women, young women, any women, because yeah. the, <laughs> the information is out there. Mm -hmm. For instance, in 2018, there was the Women's Assembly for the Women's Manifesto. And uh, this was an assembly of women from various social contexts and backgrounds. And um, we sat there, we had dialogue about um, our demands as women, as Malawian women. What do we want from those in power? What do we want? What do we envision for ourselves for the future? And there was an outcome document. We have the Women's Manifesto. It clearly outlines these demands. But I, and that's something that I would have expected them to at least not make reference to, but to use as a reference point in including women's issues in their manifestos. We would have thought that maybe things like that, like the Women's Manifesto would have been a good starting point because it's a very, um, it has very broad demands and it addresses the nuances I'm talking about, the underlying causes, and is very clear. So it would have been very easy for them to look at things like that or to undertake consultation and to take women's rights seriously. But um, looking at the manifestos of the parties, it's very clear that no thought was put into it. And they thought, might as well put women's rights because the feminists might get angry. The activists might get angry. So yeah. just slot it in somewhere okay. just to appease them. So yeah, that's that's what I got from the manifestos and their lack of um, addressing women's rights and women's needs. Yeah, so unfortunate really, isn't it? Um, it's almost like a standard really across the continent that uh, it's more like an agenda point towards the end. Oh, by the way, there's women and just include them before they make a noise, but it's not an intentional objective of something that needs to be addressed as many other urgent stuff. Elevin, thank you for joining us. I know you've got a, your issues with connection, but you know we'll just try what we can. Um, your, your sector is quite interesting. I mean, you, you've been a coordinator for Oxfam in Malawi, looking at gender rights or you know, work around gender and also around uh, extractives, which we all know in that industry, there's quite a lot going on there with um, companies you know, coming in and just doing what they want and not giving communities they pay share and some refusing to publish the annual reports, numbers and profits and so forth and so on. You, your job is a, is a very hectic one. So, you know, my question for you is that over the years, you've obviously seen continuous uh, sort of fight that is rising in terms of inequality levels between the richest and the rest in Malawi. You've also seen how, you know, poverty um, has just remained endemic as well, with some part of the population relying on humanitarian aid. So, you know, with some efforts uh, towards human development that have been done, what do you think this new dawn, if I, I keep referring to it as a new dawn, what do you think it will be able to address in terms of these, you know, inequalities that are just glaring at everybody's face? What do you think they have an opportunity of doing here in your view, Elvin? Thank, Thank you, you Jabu, for giving me an opportunity. I have to start with an apology that I'm caught up in traffic, so I might have a bit of background noise. I hope you excuse me for that, and you also won't be able to see me on video. Yeah, now to talk about okay. this government, I think they have an opportunity to improve things. That is, if they really want to save Malawians, because evidence is there that inequality in Malawi is increasing, and uh, even the causes of inequality they are very evident because the number of reports and specifically even the reports that Oxfam in Malawi produced around, I mean, about inequality. So the inequality gaps are quite high, evidence is there. And there's also some documentation explaining how maybe we can start addressing this. But unfortunately it's ignored or maybe there isn't much effort put in place to address these inequality gaps. So I, it is my hope that the new government is going to look into this. They are going to work with the already existing literature and then see how issues can be improved. Um, I'll give an example of the extractive sector. The mining communities, they have always been challenged by not being given enough information because the deals are signed between the government and the the government and the companies and mostly the communities were left out so if we are to make it right we have to follow the newly passed law on the mines and minerals act which emphasizes about community engagement 
because most of the times why we have conflicts in the mining communities, it's because they feel like they don't benefit a lot. They look at a mining as something that brings billions and billions. And when they look at a mining company, they look at money. So the moment you don't have clear transparency, it brings a lot of mistrust, misconceptions, and that affects, uh, that highly affects how the communities are going to relate with the mining companies. So maybe just to cut the long story short, if we indeed want to address inequality and if specific inequality in the mining areas, then let's increase on transparency. The government should prioritize on that. And also transparency, frequent communication, but also putting the right policies that enables the Malawians, the communities to benefit from the mining deals. And that's how they'll get it right. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Inequality is such, an, is such a major issue. You know, I, I'm, I'm really itching to get Moses into the conversation. I know that he's uh, struggling with connection, but if he can hear us, thank you again, uh, Mr. Kunkuyu, for joining us. Now, you, you're a very, if I could say, man of the moment, if I could say, because, I mean, you essentially were, you know, part of, uh, you know, what was happening in the past two weeks. You, um, you know, have been one of the campaign directors for, you know, the Malawi electoral uh, sort of group of folks. And you've also had an opportunity where you were a minister of information and communication. So you, you're pretty well versed in terms of the political rhetoric of your colleagues and some of the aspirations for the community and so forth. Um, many have described Malawi as a beacon of hope um, of opposition parties across Africa. What do you think were some of the key pillars in your view of the recent political campaigning, which ones led to success and which ones led to perhaps losses in your view because you were part of the whole campaigning uh, project? Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you clearly, thank you. Okay, uh, let me begin by apologizing that I'm, I'm indeed having some challenges with uh, the internet connection here and uh, uh you may be catching me here and not catching me the next second but uh i'm glad that i am part of this very important uh discussion uh to begin with let me say the elections that we had uh last week have been an opportunity to display the political maturity that is there now and as well as the, demo, the maturity of democracy, we see democracy coming of age. We are not there yet, but where we found people exercising their constitutional right to vote, but not just in an ordinary election, but an election that has come as a result of some other state, institu uh, uh, some other uh, institutions, public institutions, uh, standing, determined uh, to stand and safeguard the constitution uh, because the, the ruling that we should go for fresh elections was as a result of uh, a landmark, uh, a, a, a battle that was there after the rigged or rather uh, the election that was held last year and mad with irregularities. Every election, almost every election that we've had after the democratic dispensation has been said to uh, have irregularities, but the ones that we had last year uh, will, be, will go down in the history books as the worst, as ruled by the court. So there was the exercise of people's uh, uh, democratic right, that is to demand accountability on the part of the institution that conducted the elections. This is the Malawi Electoral Commission. And the same citizens uh, uh, took it upon themselves to uh, demonstrate against the powers that were there to demand justice. And also the leaders of political parties in this, in this case, Dr. Saros Chilim and Dr. Lazar Sagwera, uh, took it upon themselves to go to the courts and demand that justice uh, should be served. And the courts themselves did not look at what was being dangled in front of them, but they were determined to defend the constitution. So what we have seen is as a result of a, of, uh, a concerted effort that is between the, uh, the citizens themselves, the leaders of political parties and uh, public institution, in this case, uh, the courts. So it is not just 
hope for the opposition uh, in Malawi, but where the hope for the people and also uh, hope for other uh, uh, countries in Africa and maybe beyond that. So on the part of the Malawi Electoral Commission, it's a lesson that people can now defend their rights and institutions that are also serving the public can do things without any influence from one singular institution, be it the central government, be it the a judiciary influencing Malawi Electoral Commission or the other way around. So there is now clear independence of the institutions, institutions that are uh, serving the public. Yes. So allow me to also just take this opportunity while you, we still have you online before you break away, uh, Moses, to also just ask this question. It was the second time in 13 months that Malawians went to the polls to you know, cast their ballot in a presidential election, a rerun of, uh, of course, May 2019 presidential elections uh, that were annulled due to irregularity. So there's been some reports that you know, some of the rallies, well, you know, as reports would have it, that were quite extravagant and you know, there were parties held during campaigns and so forth. What measures did, do you think uh, Malawi's Electoral Commission put in place to assist the vulnerable people during uh, the COVID-19 as elections were happening also to quite a, in a very unique time uh, when there is a pandemic? In your view, uh, did the electoral body develop a clear code of conduct? The Malawi Electoral Commission did uh, communicate to all electoral st stakeholders that due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we will have to observe the uh, set standards, the, 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 the standards that have been set or the measures that have been put in place by the World Health Organization. This was clearly communicated to uh, all stakeholders and some of them were adhered to, but I must uh, admit that most of them were not adhered to because even the electoral commission itself, you would find them uh, sticking to one measure today and not sticking to it tomorrow, and there were no enforcement measures. Uh, uh, those measures were not uh, being enforced by the Electoral Commission. They were just advising us that let's go by this, but they were not standing by it themselves clearly. So in the end, you'd see that even the political rallies that we're having, people were throwing into those political rallies. We tried as the opposition uh, providing uh, uh, facilities that people could wash their hands, uh, providing masks in some cases, and uh, some sanitizers. Everyone could see that the rallies that we were having, uh, the uh, public address equipment that was being used was regularly sanitized after each and every user. But you know, where many people, thousands of people come together, uh, it was still a challenge to help them observe the, the distance that uh, the World Health Organization is prescribing. So I must yeah. admit that, yes, we did uh, uh, partly uh, observe or adhere to the set rules, but in a larger way, uh, the blame goes to every participant, not only the Malawi Electoral Commission. I remember when we went to present uh, nomination papers, we thronged the hall. We try to control the people. If Malawi Electoral Commission did not stand their ground to say we are not receiving any nomination papers if the hall is filled like this and we're not observing the, the distances, definitely uh, the case would have been different. But Malawi Electoral Commission stood their ground until we managed to exit some other people and maintained the figures that they had prescribed. Then we proceeded with the presentation of the papers. But come to political rallies, which are not, uh, which the commission does not have any control over, definitely there as politicians, we bear the blame. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Moses. I hope we, if you stay sit around later on, we can also get your aspirations for the new dawn in your own uh, regard as a Malawian. You know, Olemu, I need to quickly squeeze this in. We've got 15 minutes left or so, and I really, you know, want to still get through so much with you guys, all of you. I want you to just tell me as a young woman who's a founder of, uh, you know, Young Feminists Network, what factors do you think influence women's ability to rise up significantly to parliament or positions of power within the legal fraternity uh, so that they can be part of the conversation of legislating quite relevant laws that have to do with their livelihoods in the country? How? <laughs> I'll just... Um, 
I think there are many factors which influence um, young women or women in general rising up to positions of decision making. And I want to shed more light on the obstacles that exist because there are definitely more obstacles than there are not. So I think the stereotypical norms and values that people hold in society, in different spheres of society, I think they play a huge role in um, stopping young women or women in general from holding uh, decision-making positions. So um, you hear all the time things like women can't lead or when a woman is assertive, she's bossy or she's too much. So these things that sound like, they sound small. Someone would be like, that's not a big deal. It's just, it's a joke sometimes even. But then it does play a role because not only does it affect those who are meant to implement the laws which um, encourage women's participation um, from, yeah, they stop the people who are meant to implement them from implementing them because they have no willpower. To them, they hold the same stereotypes. They're human as well. So if they hold those stereotypes, then who is going to enforce the laws and the policies which are put in place to actually help women advance? Yeah. And at, at the same time, apart from those who are meant to actually implement the laws and policies, the ordinary person, the ordinary citizen who's going to go to the ballot box and vote, if they hold those stereotypes and they believe that women can't lead, then definitely women are not going to get into those positions because the people who are meant to vote for them don't even think that they're competent enough. And in addition to that, um, there's this thing of when a woman is in a position of power, she is judged, gender comes first. So people have this weird relationship with gender. They, they bring it up where it's not relevant and where it actually is relevant, it's ignored. So um, if a woman is in power, so for instance, I'll speak to the Malawian context. Um, Joyce Banda um, was a former president, a woman, and Jane Ansa who was the former uh, chairperson of the Malawi Electoral Commission. Society has deemed them incompetent. They fail to do their job, therefore they're incompetent. Now all of a sudden it's, why should another woman lead? Why should another woman be president? Why should another woman be chairperson of the electoral commission? They failed, so they've done you a disservice. That means you can't, but you never hear the same thing when it's a man, you never do. Um, I didn't hear even, a, not even a single soul. I didn't see a single tweet, a Facebook post when Lazarus Jagra was contesting for the office of president of Malawi. I didn't see anyone say, well, I'm not gonna vote for him because he's a man. And look what, look what men have done to, and we've had more male leaders than female leaders, but you'll never hear that. So it's things like that, that really act as a barrier for women to, to succeed or to even uh, reach those positions because of these misconceptions and this stereotypical way of thinking. So yeah. I think in order for us to be able to claim those spaces, these seemingly small things need to be dealt with first. The yeah. um, stereotypes that people hold, this way of thinking of always putting a woman's gender or sex before her work, it needs to stop because the same doesn't apply to men. You'll never yeah. hear a man say, I can't, I can't buy for that position because the last person who did was a man. So he made us all look bad. So I definitely, I, I'm not gonna succeed. But for women, that's a daily thing. And it's not only in, for instance, yeah, like it's not only for, let's say the presidential office or yeah. parliament that goes, it's at every level, even in the workplace, you hear that often that, oh no, this person was a woman. So it's gonna be hard for me to aspire to do the same thing because everyone holds these um, misconceptions. Yeah. So those are some of the barriers that need to be eradicated for women to be able to succeed. Sure, sounds like deja vu, Ulemu, I tell you, it cuts across. So nothing new there. Levi, I, I want to just you know, get a sense from you in terms of, do, do you think this new president will be able to bridge this uh, political divide that is there in Malawi already? And, and what are some of the points uh, for Malawi's transformation in your view? What are some of the sort of sticking out sore points that he can, you know, quick wins for him at this time? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jamilila. And I think your question really ties into the previous point that uh, Ulema was making around, uh, you know, uh, the capacities of women in Malawi and how women have been viewed. Uh, and if you're looking at the stats, uh, you know, for population, you know, women, I think, uh, hold 
uh, the highest demographic, at just I think over 50%. And that's also true for, for young women. And if you consider the facts that uh, about 50 or so percent of uh, Malawi's total population is under 18, you begin to see the need to actually address this question, as uh, Ulemu was saying. And it doesn't need any kind of sophistication. Uh, it really goes to what she was saying, that some of these things really look um, very small, but they're not uh, for a society like ours in Malawi. So the big challenge for this government is to actually consider that fact, uh, right? And how are we going to work around this? Of course, the main problem here is that you have um, an alliance that's dominated by male leaders, uh, except for Joyce Bander, who's also part of the alliance. But when it comes to, you know, aggregating where power lies, uh, then, you know, it puts her uh, and other women at a disadvantage. The other day, President Chakwera uh, then made a comment to say his cabinet is going to be comprised of 40% uh, women, which is very exciting and news which was really greeted um, with much enthusiasm. But we want to see what sort of polls um, the women are going to be given and how central they are to then shifting this architecture, this societal architecture in Malawi for the benefit uh, of women. Women in Malawi have borne uh, you know, um, the brunt of just holding uh, that nation uh, together. And it's really the high time uh, that, you know, uh, power shifts, but it's not going to shift uh, on its own or willingly. Really There's going to be a lot of resistance. There's a lot of uh, talk that goes on in most circles, uh, in most male dominated circles, that really uh, is also um, not uh, sensitive or even attuned uh, to the fact of how we need to approach. Uh, the gender dynamics uh, in Malawi. So that's the biggest challenge I think uh, that this new government faces, in addition to actually trying to hold itself uh, together. So politically speaking, there are going to be lots of challenges in trying to keep the unity of the alliance together. And some of those contestations are going to emerge in our cabinet positions, our appointments to state parastatals, or state-owned enterprises, as you call them in South Africa, are going to be done, um, basically. So there's just going to be contestation there. Then over time, it really becomes the aspiration of an, um, the Malawi Congress Party, which is the main party in this alliance, um, which I think is a very conservative party as well. So one of my fears is really around the scaling back of rights, of women's rights, of the rights of LGBTIQ in Malawi, which we have made significant strides, uh, you know, so the rights of minorities, of the of marginalized groups, people with albinism, for example, it's really too early to say what this government would do, but one hopes that then these rights uh, are protected, even if uh, as you know, that we have uh, Lazarus Sugara is a reverend, uh, his uh, former pastor is an ev ev evangelical preacher. So we also have to guard against Malawi becoming a theocracy, uh, as it were, because we are a secular nation, we are a constitutional democracy, and we just have to keep that. And that space, unfortunately, would have to be defended by a young women uh, like Ulem, because a lot of the men are just going to say, you know, whatever cause and leave that uh, at that. So there's work uh, for, for people like that. Yeah. So there's certainly sort of concerns of uh, so much significance of work, you know, done, for example, as you say, with the LGBTQI plus community that's been taken so long and probably, you know, fears of how, how's this going to go? Will, will it uh, be on an incline or decrease? So we, we, it's interesting to see what he's going to do, of course, knowing as well, um, yeah, the kind of, you know, uh, sort of headspace he's at, but we'll see. He's, he's new, he needs to get into office and do his thing, and then we'll see what he does. Ulemu, um, so we've said a lot about women not being in power, and, and Levi just mentioned a very important point of how the president said 40% would be women, but he's also highlighted something quite key that says, but where exactly will these be women placed at? So it's okay to say, you know, there'll be 40%, but what exactly will they be doing? And um, how close to decision-making deci uh, sort of powers will they be? My question to you is, um, 
do you think, why as a young woman, do you think Malawi struggles with uh, managing policy and practice to empower the lives of emerging women leaders? In your view, where are the gaps and what do you propose? Where, where's the link, well, what's the gap between these two things, you know, policy and, uh, and practice? Um, I think that gender equality and women empowerment have been used as buzzwords for a very long time. So instead of actually being used as tools to address inequality, it's just now become a thing, it's more of a cosmetic thing. So people don't take it seriously enough. It's something that's just there for people to look good, to look good either to donors or to citizens themselves. And so they're on paper, on paper, everything is good. It's perfect. The laws, the policies, everything seems to be in place. However, because of this idea that um, gender equality isn't something that they should actually strive for, but it's something that should just be on paper so that everything looks good. I think this has translated into the lack of implementation of the laws and the policies. Mm. And so you find that they're con everyone is content with it being on paper. Like we have it in the constitution, in the manifesto, we've said we're going to uphold the constitution. So that should be enough. So I think it's, yeah, I think it starts from the parties themselves. For instance, like I said, the manifestos. So parties themselves, and when they get into power and they're the ones who now have to have to put these things um, into practice, they fail to do that because for them, it was never a serious matter to begin with. It was just something they put in there. So now when it's time to actually implement, they're like, okay, well, at least it's on paper. And also further to that, I think there's a lack of accountability. So either amongst the decision makers themselves and the duty bearers, but even for us to hold other people, the, to, for us to hold them accountable. I think we also um, lack in that area. And so I think it's, we have to take that as something that it's a burden that has to be shared. Yes, they're responsible, but we have to make sure that they are responsible. So we have to ensure that they're being held accountable. And even from these elections that have taken place, we've seen that the people hold the power. The ordinary citizen is the one that holds the power. And so if, we decide that we're going to hold them accountable through every single step. If you said in your manifesto that you're going to do A, B, C, D, from, that very, from the very beginning, we need to take note of that and say, okay, or even address the gaps, the gaps that I spoke about earlier, we need to address them at an, at an earlier stage so that when now um, the party comes into power, we can hold them to account and say, look, you said you're going to do this, you haven't done it. And so I think we need to be empowered as citizens or even myself, for instance, as an activist. It's something that um, I have to constantly keep in the back of my mind because if no one holds them accountable, then nothing's going to happen. And sadly, those are the facts. If the yeah. citizens are silent, they'll continue to do or not to do what they're meant to do. So yeah. I think, and it just goes to show, that's why I keep, for me, it's just the elections have really shown me like I said, it's my first time and I didn't know that the people held that much power because <laughs> these are all institutions and you start thinking that the institution is bigger than the people. Yeah. But it isn't and it can never be because it's people who run the institution. So as long as we continue to hold them accountable, then I think that's when we'd see results and that's when there'd be a link between policy, the laws and policies and practice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, certainly the power is with the people. And I think this is what a lot of politicians forget. Uh, unfortunately, just across the world, really, uh, they tend to think that people do not have the power. Levi, in terms of, we literally have just five minutes to, to wrap up. And we, I mean, due to network, some of our guests are probably struggling. They may not uh, join us again. So we'll have to just reserve questions for them. Um, you know, do you, does Malawi have a strong opposition in parliament? to help keep the ruling party in check? Like how would you define Malawi's state of democracy? For example, we've seen here the advent of coalitions in South Africa over the past two years and so forth. Right, um, <laughs> when you speak to Moses after the call, he was Minister of Information. So ask him why as minister, he didn't fix uh, these issues around network and stuff. <laughs> um, but, it, it, you know, I think, it's 
Now, not a yes. Yeah, so parliament for the process and stuff. So what was effectively the party in power, uh, the DPP under Mutarika, is effectively the opposition. And if I'm not mistaken, we have up to about 55 uh, independent uh, members of parliament who could decide what they want to do with, you know, um, with their voting power, as it were, whether to move it to the opposition or to move it to uh, the alliance that is now in power, which um, itself as the alliance does not have a significant uh, majority as it were. So it will still need, I think the, all of the 55 uh, independent MPs plus about eight or 10 from uh, the DPP to have like a, a majority. So there's going to be various contestations there and mm -hmm. parliament is really a gallery for, you know, uh, it's quite animated, but the real opposition uh, is let me say, has become the people of Malawi. And I really get excited and energized when I hear young women like her speak because something has actually shifted in their consciousness. It's been a long time since 1964. It's a long time since 1994. So this new potential, or it's not even potential anymore because we saw what the young people who went to the streets with some of the elites, you know, in Malawi saying, no, you know, they're, um, you know, causing havoc, why can't they just people, you know, petition silently and go home, uh, you know, we want to drive home and get home to eat our, you know, pap, our wansima, but the roads are blocked because you have young people in the streets, but look what it actually did, and there was a lot of that, but look what it did, and this is the energy of the young people, so if this Tonse Alliance under Chakwera, if they forget that, they ought to be reminded by young people, for parliament, yes, for certain things, passing budgets, passing laws, but the real power, if, as we have seen in Malawi, is with the people. And these people are young people. And who do you have amongst these young people? You have young feminists, you have young women. And I'll say, Jabulile, uh, in closing, I will vote, I will actually go home, corona or no corona, to vote in Malawi the day we have a young woman running for president. That yeah. will be the day I actually go home uh, yeah. and vote. Absolutely, quite inspirational. Uh, I mean, this is my last question and I want you to wrap it up as short as you possibly can, Levi. How would you personally just rate the manner in which elections were held this past two weeks? Um, and do you think Malawi has somewhat, uh, somehow set a bar for electoral integrity for the rest of Africa? And when you're done with that, please tell us your hopes for Malawi. <laughs> uh, two quick points. One was the technology that, uh, at least I can say this, that I was part of in 2014 in rolling out on accountability. So receiving data from various uh, polling stations from across the country, collecting that and having evidence on your own outside of the Malawi Electoral Commission useful. We saw it in 2020. It was, it worked wonders. One of the most powerful images that I saw were people who were moving and guarding ballot boxes from a polling station to where votes were being counted. So people physically, not interfering, but just saying, we're going to accompany you to ensure that you don't steal our votes. For me, that was really, this is what, um, uh, what, what really matters. My hopes for Malawi, as I've been saying in my various writings, is really for a country. Malawi is a very beautiful country. It's, uh, it's got some of the most dynamic, the most creative uh, people in Africa, if not in the world. We just want a, we just want a government in power that unlocks all that potential as quickly as possible and give young Malawians who are thirsting for the for those opportunities and thirsting uh, for success to actually you know, feel at home to embrace their citizenship and contribute meaningfully to the future uh, of Malawi. That would be my hope. Sure, that's a mouthful. That's, I hope, I hope politicians would be listening at least to this clip so they can get a sense of where they can start. There's, there's certainly more than enough tips here on where they can actually begin the spade work. Ulemu, you know, they one of my last questions. That's the problem. <laughs> that's true, eh? <laughs> so, I mean, you, um, you know, as a young woman, and through your observation, 
how do you think government should, and not just government, how do you think government, civil society and industry should support young women in their diverse ways or diverse pathways? And also as a young feminist in Malawi in the 21st century at this you know, ad, uh, advent of this new dawn, what are your dreams and hopes for Malawi? Um, okay, firstly, I think the way that government, uh, civil society, and other institutions can support young women is by not, I don't use the word allowing because it sounds like someone's doing you a favor, <laughs> but um, by us, I'll, I'll use allowing, even though I don't want to, by allowing us to be a part of the decision making, basically to give us a seat at the table. There's this saying, and my mom likes using this if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that's just facts, that's how it goes. So young women need to be invited to the table. I'll, I'll use the word invited because there are people who hold power, who are responsible for who gets to enter these um, spaces. At the end of the day, that's what happens. So young women need to be a part of um, all the conversations, making contributions for the development of the country. And this should be at every stage. Young women, like I said before, young women shouldn't be an afterthought. Yeah. We shouldn't be used as tokens because we're used now, you know, feminism is popping, everything, you know, it, it looks good right now. To have young women in spaces, it looks really, really good. It's a good look, but then we don't want it. We don't want to be used uh, just to look good or as tokens. We actually want to make meaningful contributions. And I think that's what will help in not only young women being empowered, but also being able to make decisions that affect their lives. Because no one can make a decision, no one can make a decision for you better than yourself. So we need to be actually a part of decision making and actually at the table, uh, giving contributions. And for, as for my hopes for the future, um, firstly, I think I I want us to realize as we've all highlighted here the power of the people. Because this, I think this is what is the key for us to be able to bring about transformation in society. When we realize the power that we actually hold, when we stop thinking that I'm just an ordinary citizen, I'm just one person, what am I gonna do? What's my vote going to do? It won't make a difference if I stay home and don't go to vote. We should learn a lesson. And my hope is that every young person will learn a lesson from what just happened and if, if there are certain things that we fail to do, I hope that we'll be able to do them next time with this newly found wisdom in mind. And I also hope that um, as has been pointed out, um, when the demonstrations were happening, some people sat at home and they, and I mean, it's, it's your right to stay home. It's not by force for you to go to the streets, but a lot of people sat home and we're against the demonstrations, but are now celebrating. And they're ignoring the fact that this was a culmination of lots of things. They're praising the judiciary, they're praising a lot of people, but the other, the little people, so to speak, the people who may not be on the front page, may not be the focus of discussion right now, but for young people to look at those people who played a role and to not forget them. And next time something like this happens, for more of us, more of the youth to be involved, and not to leave it to um, other people, but for everyone to actually play a role because it's our future. So it's up to us to actually make sure that what we want happens by getting involved. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ulemu Kanyongolo, um, founder of African Young Feminist Network. Thank you so much uh, for your contributions. I have no doubt that they'll go as far and wide as possible for other young feminists to just get some some learnings from what you've shared. Uh, Levi, social and political commentator, thank you for your input. Thank you for your time as well. And to our guests, we, by the way, couldn't be joined by Ellen Tata, who had apologized. We had Moses Kumkuyu, who was the National Campaign Director of the ruling Malawi Congress Party and former Minister of Information and Government Spokesperson. He joined us for a bit. We appreciate that time. Unfortunately, networks are uh, something that are, are beyond our control, but we, we thank him for that time. And we also had Elvin uh, Chawinga, who is also a gender and extractive activist. We had some questions for her, but conversations like this can never happen in 60 minutes. So we just have to be glad with the fact that we've planted the seed and began 
some form of movement towards the right direction and others can be able to pick up and carry on and spread it wider in their own corners as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Cheers, Jibilile. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Cheers, Ulemu.